Welcome back to Computer Science E259. My name is David Malin, and this is Lecture 4, XPath 1.0 and XSLT 1.0, and parenthetically, XPath 2.0 and XSLT 2.0. Uh, just a few days before this class began this semester, uh, we've had the fortune of introducing to the course officially XPath 2 and XSLT2 since they were just ratified as recommendations, just a few days shy of the start of the course. So um, it turns out, as you may um, expect, since these things were just officially made recommendations, the support for XSLT2 and XPath2 is not terribly widespread yet. There exists one excellent reference implementation thereof, but for the most part, um, Apache has yet to announce official plans for supporting XSLT2 and XPath2, though I suspect now that it's in recommendation form, that it is more likely to happen than not. So what we will do for the next week or so is focus mostly on XSLT1 and XPath1, both of which are now subsets effectively of what is 2.0, and we'll get out of those more than enough to keep us busy, I think, for the next week or two. And what we'll do next week is I'll try to point out some of the features that versions 2 offer of both of these languages that, for the most part, redress weaknesses in the first versions of these languages that people have sort of discovered over time. So with that said, Let's take a look back first. Last week we looked at DOM, JAXP, my first parser, and Xerxes. Um, let's pluck off each of these bullet points. DOM in one sentence is what? That's a what? Tree. So it's a tree view of your XML document. Uh, what types of nodes appear in a DOM? Attribute nodes? Anyone? Text nodes? Element nodes? Comments? Comments? Oh, we, uh, doc, uh, the, uh, text nodes, processing instructions, document node, you know, a namespace node, and you can come up. Um, we pretty much looked at most, but dwelled more on a few of them. Uh, Jack's P in one sentence. That is not the acronym. Java interface to the DOM and Okay, so it's the Java interface to DOM and SACS, or just more generally to all things related to XML processing, a subset of which are the DOM and SACS API. So JAXP is simply the Java implementation of those. And you get for free when you download now the Java JDK, um, the implementation um, in Java, all of the APIs that we have been discussing. Xerces in particular is developed by the Apache project. That is sort of the uh, perhaps most widespread standard for implementation for an XML parser that supports both of these APIs as well. And recall that we've downloaded more recent versions of Xerces to override what ships with Sun's JDK. And over the next year or two, that's probably something, if you continue to use this kind of software, that you would want to do yourself. Um, DOM level three, this was an example document recall, and we depicted it as such, sort of salient characteristics of a DOM. Recall that attributes are children of elements, yes, no? Uh, it's not quite siblings, though we sort of, at least visually, tend to hang them off the tree laterally. Yeah, it's sort of like a property. It's, it's not a child, in short, of an element node, but the parent of an attribute is, in fact, the element to which it belongs. And though that's been trivia up until now, as we continue to use these sorts of things, that will become a useful thing to bear in mind, at least to remember those kinds of definitions. Um, at the top, we have this root node, not to be confused with the root element. And we have this document node up top so that we can hang on to everything in the document, including preceding comments, PIs, doc type declarations, and so forth. And then finally, how many root elements softball can a document have? Just one just one, and everything else is beneath that. Um, we'll defer to your experience with Project One for some of the nuances on white space. Perhaps some of you feel all the more expert at white space issues with XML now. Yeah? I'm just wondering, there's a horrible white space method, and I'm wondering if that applies to DOM, and if so, does that allow you to clean out some of those text nodes that you might not otherwise want there? Uh, ignorable white space method in the DOM API? No. Um, I, let's see, the met, what is its definition? Do you recall? The, sh the short of it is I'd have to check offhand. Oh, okay. um, I, I can take a look at break time. So in theory, absolutely, you could whittle away any of the white space that you don't want within these nodes. The easier way, as we'll see come lecture seven or so, is to simply ensure that the 
um, DOM is built in accordance with a DTD or schema, which implies that that white space should be thrown away at parse time. That would be the, the simpler approach. You could do it on the first pass. Other questions about DOM? No? Um, JAXP, Xerces, these recall were some of the uh, classes or packages that we focused on and we'll continue using after project two. We'll return to these APIs and we of course spent quite a while over the past three weeks on my first XML parser. So tonight's material I think is fun. XSLT in particular I think is one of the most useful languages to come out of all things XML. Um, it is simultaneously both a quick and dirty language with which you can take you know, interesting data sets formatted in XML and convert them effectively to something else. And it's a useful language in general for converting XML from one format to another, be the output format HTML or XHTML, text, some other XML document, or some other format altogether. We'll be using it throughout the next several weeks, in particular uh, with Project 2, when you output not only a web-based version of London's Underground and more, but also a graphical version using a language called SVG. Um, CSS, though, is where we begin tonight. And this is something that you're probably all familiar with or have perhaps used in your own web development um, in a sentence. What are casca cascading style sheets all about? Level 2 is effectively just the version number. What's CSS used for? Yeah. Sure. So CSS is all about developing templates or style sheets that allow you to specify quite precisely uh, a lot of the aesthetics of a document, the width, the height, the formatting, the color, the fonts, and so forth. And it allows you to factor out that sort of aesthetic information from what historically was all very jumbled up together in one .html file. You probably recall things like the font tag and the h1 tag and so forth, which all sort of had predefined meanings, but only to an extent, whereby the browsers were ultimately able to um, interpret H1 as it saw fit and font size equals 2 as it sees fit. Well, with CSS, can you specify much more precisely the aesthetics of your document? And because it can stand independently of an HTML document, that is to say you can include a CSS file via the head of your HTML document, you can separate, for the most part, a lot of your content from the actual presentation thereof. And so CSS sort of lets you take a, an HTML page or an XHTML page the final mile and clean it up and present it in a more precise way than historically you were able to do with HTML alone. And if you're not too familiar with CSS, that's okay. You'll pick up what details you might want over the course of this semester, but for the most part, it's not something that we're going to rely on. We introduce it tonight only because it has in common with XSLT this notion of a style sheet. So cascading style sheets versus um, extensible style sheet transformations. Uh, extensible uh, style sheet transformations. So what's the relevance? So when XML was first being introduced, it was realized that it would be a useful thing. If you could take an XML document and control the presentation of it. So you're not just looking at what is effectively a human readable document, but you can actually convert those nodes and present nodes, elements in the document using some kind of aesthetic markup like HTML. And in fact, you can do this with cascading style sheets. You may recall from your own experience with cascading style sheets that in a cascading style sheet, you can effectively override or define, the defini define what it means to be the H1 tag by simply specifying something like font uh, size colon 11 point semicolon squiggly. And if this effectively is, are the sole contents of your cascading style sheet file, what that means is when you apply this style sheet to your HTML file, any H1 tag in that file is going to be rendered in font size 11 point. So the relationship, or at least the proposed relationship initially to XML was that, well, wait a minute, we have this style sheet language already, CSS, why don't we just employ it for the transformation of XML into something that's sort of um, more visually pleasing, that's something uh, marked up in HTML. In other words, if we have in our database, of, in XML file, if we have something like a, let's say, uh, let's say an item element, well, just as h1 is a tag in HTML, so was item recall an element in one of our sample files for project one. So what you could imagine doing in cascading style sheets is defining items to simply be displayed in font size 11 point. That is to say, if you have a dot, an item 
in your file called foo, well, if you apply this style sheet to an XML document with that content, well, you wouldn't see open bracket item, close bracket foo, open bracket, or slash item. Instead, you would see the word foo in 11 point in the output document. But what you don't have with cascading style sheets is the ability really to impose any kind of logic. There's really no ability to program against XML and that's among other things what XSLT allows us to do. It doesn't allow us to just say present the item tag as such and the widget tag as follows but rather it allows us to manipulate XML content and simultaneously transform XML into something else altogether. And this is perhaps best explained by way of demonstration, and we'll do that in just a moment. So, yeah? Good question. Is this conceptually different from SACS and DOM? So it's a good question, and I would say yes. The short answer is that XSLT is conceptually distinct from SACS and DOM um, to the extent that you could actually build an XSLT processor on top of, for instance, the SACS or DOM APIs. In reality, you probably wouldn't for performance reasons, but this is simply, dare say, a higher level language, one written in XML itself that you can apply to XML documents and how the manipulation of the raw XML is implemented is then a matter for, uh, a, is then a design decision. Do you use the SACS API? Do you use the DOM? Do you use something of your own design? So, so inherent in XSLT is again this ability to transform XML content. Well that sort of begs the question, how do you get at that XML content. Well, in the SACS APIs, when we were programming in Java, you could get at XML content by way of those event handlers. So you could get at the contents of an element by writing code in the start element routine. And you could get at the raw character data in the document by implementing the characters routine. Now contrast that with DOM, and you had routines that would allow you to call get child nodes, or get child node, or get nodes by node name. Those kinds of features that allowed you to pull data from a specific location in the document. Well, what XSLT allows you to do is similarly get at XML data, but in dare say the most intuitive um, method that we've seen thus far by using what's called XPath. XPath is an XML path language, and essentially it allows us to treat and view XML as something that's inherently hierarchical, much like a computer's file system is, and just as to navigate to your copy of Microsoft Word, you might go to C colon backslash program files, backslash office, backslash winword.exe. Well, similarly, if you want to get at a node in an XML document whose root node is foo, whose child is bar, and whose subchild is then baz, well, you can simply specify foo slash bar slash baz and very intuitively dive into the document by simply following the hierarchy that's evident in the file itself. And in short, that's what XPath allows us to do. And it's pretty much been around since the beginning, certainly the beginning of all things XML. Let's give one precise definition, but then turn our attention away from the formalities and just dive in with an example, because I think this, this language, these, these pairs of languages, XSLT and XPath, are really best explained by demonstration, and we'll do that before proceeding to formalize some things. This is XPath at its core. So as the name itself implies, XPath is all about paths and sort of navigating via a path to the data that you're interested in. You can, and more formally, it's called a location path. So you can specify a specific chunk of data in your file by way of a location path. This is a representative one. So it's a simplified one so that we can talk about some of the interesting features, but for the most part, this is representative of what it means to use XPath. If you want to dive into a document and pull out some relevant data, you follow a location path, but a location path in turn is made up of one or more steps, as they're called. And you can literally think of steps as taking you one level deeper and deeper into the document. And so what steps allow you to do, though, is to make decisions as to what kinds of steps you want to make. Well, what does that mean? Well, in short, this location path here, if we apply this to a relevant XML document, and you can sort of infer that you would probably apply this to some kind of movie database, an XML file containing data on movies, well, what this implies is that we want to grab, start at the root element and follow the movie's root element 
proceed to the movie child thereof, and then specifically, we're going to apply what's called a predicate or a filter by rating. And in short, what this location path, as we'll see in just a moment uh, for certain, does is it selects all movies that are rated R in the document. It's as simple as that. And more precisely, it selects all movie nodes in the document that are rated R. Or more precisely, it selects all nodes in the document that are of type elements that are named movie and that are children of a parent called movies that is itself the child of the root of the document. And we will rarely try to be that precise, since really I think the intuition is much more clear than that. But just notice how we're sort of relying on the basic definitions here that we've been using over the past few weeks. So let's refine this a little bit. Here's a step. This means we're literally diving one, let's say, depth deeper into the document. Well, what's this all about? Well, it turns out that in XPath there are different types of steps you can take. And perhaps the most common, dare say, is the child axis, as it's called. That is to say, if you want to step deeper into the document, odds are you're going to be following a sequence of elements. But there are other types of paths, or other types of steps rather, because we might not want to dive down deeper into the document. We might want to sort of move along it laterally and grab in attribute, for instance. So as we'll see, attribute colon colon specifies a different type of step. Not so much deeper into the document, but you know, if we use our visual of the DOM sort of to the side to grab an attribute. Well, this specifies specifically start at the root and find all children of the root that are named movies. Similarly, does this say at that point, once you've taken all nodes named movies, of which there's obviously going to be one, simply by definition of having begun at the root of the document, well, find all children that are called movie. Well, it remains then to tease apart what this is. Well, if you want to filter the final node set, as it's called, that you get back, the return value of these paths is, is what's called a node set, a collection of nodes, uh, an array of nodes, if you will. Well, you can filter the remaining nodes by way of what are called predicates. You enclose these in brackets, and you simply specify the filter or the predicate that you want to apply. Turns out that this, too, is a step, but it's shorthand notation, which we'll come back to. But fortunately, the at symbol implies what type of axis would you guess? Attributes, sort of a useful play on words. What this means is take all of the movie elements in the current context and only select those whose attribute called rating equals obviously quote unquote R. Which is to say if this database has a whole bunch of movies rated G, PG, PG13, and R, we're going to have all of those nodes in our node set at this point in the path, but as soon as we apply this predicate, Everything except the R-rated movies is thrown away. And so what we have at the end of this entire location path is a node set containing a whole bunch of zero or more movie elements, all of which are rated R. So let's, yeah? You can. You can. You can indeed. We'll come back to that, but yes, you can actually move in multiple directions in the document. The simplest uh, axis of which to describe would be the parent axis, which allows you to go higher up in the document. And we'll see all such axes in just a moment. The best way, I think, to acclimate yourself to XPath and XSLT, to be honest, is visually and is by playing around. And so what our goal tonight will be will be to introduce, one, the basics, the fundamentals and the definitions and so forth, and to give you a taste of the constructs that exist in XPath and XSLT to point you at the relevant resources. But for the most part, just like HTML is sort of uh, well suited for teaching yourself once you have the basics, right? it's not hard to just pull up a reference and say, how do I make something bold? Well, you look that up. Well, similarly is XSLT defined. It's not a terribly large language. We'll pluck off, I think, the more complicated parts in lecture, the more interesting parts, the more fundamental parts. But realize that it's to some of the online references and to some of the examples we give out that will defer some of the other details. I think it would quickly get boring if we walked through from page one to page n of the specification everything you can do with XSLT. But you'll see that I think it's a fun language to pick up. So what I am going to turn to now is a program called Stylus Studio. This, recall from lecture one, is one of the programs that we can, uh, you can download off the course's website. I arranged with the authors of the software for a semester-long trial, so you have full 
uh, uninhibited uh, access to the software for the next several months. An equivalent program of sorts is called XML Spy. XML Spy is perhaps the more popular or common of the two. I personally have a bias toward uh, Stylus Studio because one, I genuinely think it's a little simpler to use, a little more user friendly, but two, um, a few friends of mine were the original authors, so it's sort of what I grew up on, so to speak, on this stuff. But both of them are accessible to you via the course's website, and both of them have semester-long trials, so it is up to you which one to use. And they are wonderful tools, not only for writing XSLT, and a lot of the uh, web-oriented design we'll be doing in this course, um, it is all, all, they are also wonderful learning tools, if only because, like in a lot of IDEs like Eclipse, when you start typing, little windows pop up and tell you what your options are. It's a wonderful way to learn and to reinforce some of these concepts. Honestly, when you're typing your location pads, you little, literally get a context menu that tells you what are the next possible steps you can take. And so use them as well as learning tools, not just time-saving techniques. So what I've done is I've installed Stylus Studio on this computer. I installed the key code as well, and what I'm going to do is quite simply go to the open menu, and I have in advance downloaded not only Project 2, but also the examples directory from tonight. I'm going to dive right into Project 2, and I'm going to go to my Blockbuster, and specifically the XML directory, where there's a file awaiting you when you download Project 2 yourself called myblockbuster.xml. This is a little different from the example we just looked at because there's much more data in it and it's structured in a uh, slightly different way, a non-simplified way, but the spirit is identical. This is effectively a flat file database of data about movies. And movies have actors, movies have ratings, movies have titles, and so forth, and all of that is captured in this file here. Uh, just glancing at this, and is the font size big enough in the background? What's the easy question? Root element of this document. Okay, good. So database is the root element, and I'm going to turn off or move some of these things out of the way. Okay. Figure out how to get rid of these all together later. Oh, you know what? Uh, with every version, do they add more and more features to the software? <laughs> None of which, frankly, we've ever needed. All right as is the case with a lot of products, perhaps. Okay, so it's now a little higher up. So clearly up here we have the first child node of the root of the document called actors. Um, each of these, and this actors element in turn, seems to have a whole bunch of actor children. Okay, each actor has an attribute of some number, presumably a unique ID, and they also have some character data as the sole child, specifically the actor's name. If we now scroll down, notice that the movies begins as the second child of the database root element. A movie, in turn, and you have a printout of this among tonight's handouts, similarly has a, an ID, presumably a unique ID. A title looks like an image name, a file name, uh, a genre, rating, summary, details, the year, director, and so forth. Fairly self-explanatory, most of them. Not every movie has all of these fields, so occasionally you will see in the file an empty element, which just means it's not available in DVD, or we didn't know what the price was. So you can certainly see empty elements in the document as well. What we're going to begin with right now is using Stylus as an expat, a tool for XPath queries. So specifically, what I'm going to do is the following. Uh, let's take a look here. Um, Mm-hmm. It's great when they change the program, literally. There we go. Okay. XPath Query Editor. All right. So what we have now at right is what they now call an XPath Query Editor. And what this is literally going to let us do is type in some XPath queries and get back the results and answer questions of the form. One what does this query return? And two, what query can we type to get at some of the data? And we'll do just a few representative ones just to get the ideas across, and then we'll integrate XPath and these ideas into the context of XSLT itself. So with that said, um, let's do something simple like select the root of the document. What we have it right here below the query window is essentially a representation of the nodes returned by this query, the so-called node set. So selecting the root of the document isn't terribly interesting, but what nodes 
you know, per our conversation of DOM and so forth. And you'll see, incidentally, and we'll get into more detail into this tonight, just as DOM has the notion of nodes and so forth, so does XPath and XSLT have their own definitions of nodes and types of nodes. For the most part, the models are identical, though they're independently defined. So fortunately, we can borrow a lot of the jargon from the past and just assume it applies in the present. So the root of the document has what kinds of nodes? This document specifically, if we look from the top on down. I mean, it's kind of enumerated for us there. So we have certainly text, which just is this white space stuff up there. We do have indeed a comment followed by more text, which is just white space in this case, followed by the root element, followed by it looks like some text, probably some trailing white space at the very end of the document. So let's do a query. Suppose I wanted to select all of the uh, actor elements. What am I going to type? Okay, so slash child colon, colon, database, sorry, and here we go, context sensitive, the answers are going to start revealing themselves, where can we go next, so we can go to actors, specifically the child axis and actors, so if I go ahead and hit the play button in Silas, which just means execute this query, now we get back one hit. So that gave me all the actors elements, of which there is in fact just one, if I want actor, all such elements, well, it's obviously going to be just child followed by actor, execute that, and now we get back a node set of size 39. So what this effectively means in programmatic terms, even though we're interacting with this in sort of a demo format, what this means is that if I use that query in some program or in some XSLT style sheet, what would be returned is a node set of size 39, literally containing those 39 nodes. Let's immediately jump to something more interesting. I now want to select not just these actor elements, but the names thereof. Well, what do I want to do then? So open, okay, so the name, recall, using open brackets simply allows to specify predicates, which are filters. They don't allow us to specify exactly what kind of content we want to get back. Yeah, so we want to get the text. Well, how might we do that? All right, so let's try child, colon, colon. What do we want to do? Text? No? Do we know? Hmm. So let's come back to that. Somehow or other, we need to be able to get at not only the elements themselves, but potentially the names. If the goal, for instance, in XSLT is to output the value of these nodes, or really what's in, inside of the open tag and the closed tag. So let's defer that for a moment, and let's come back to the question that we began with on the board, which was, how do we select all movie elements rated R? And realize that this file, as I said, or cautioned, it's slightly differently structured than the example we saw a moment ago. So recall that a representative movie now looks like this. So if I want to select all movies rated R, what would you have me do? Slash? Slash? Database? Database? You do, you, there's only one, and you only have to specify it as such, but the reason we can actually get away with, and Stylus is letting us get away with just typing database, is that fortunately, because the child axis is perhaps the most commonly used, a shorthand notation for the child axis is to specify none at all. So it literally looks even more like a path on a file system. So this is shorthand notation, and that's perfectly acceptable. So with that, we can start saving characters already. We can dive down, obviously, to now movies. And from there, we can go to movie. Now, how, notice if I hit enter, this is going to return some 18 movie elements. And notice stylus gives us an object-oriented view of the world where if I expand this with the plus, you can see inside of this node, which is a nice thing as well. Well, I only want to select R-rated movies, which means we do want startup.com, because upon some introspection here, we see that it's rated R. The second movie, in turn, though, is rated PG-13. That's The Fugitive. So we want to filter out movies like The Fugitive, how do I get rid of all such movies? There's going to be a predicate, because that's how we do filtration. Sorry? So at? OK, let's try that. Ah, good point. It seems to return 0. And notice again, the dis difference between this actual file and the sample code we looked at at the board is that we model ratings differently. How are ratings defined in this file? Yeah, they're child elements. So we don't want the attribute axis, but rather we want 
the child axis. So we can actually get away with saying nothing at all and just say rating. Or we could be more precise and say child. But realize the moment you open this square bracket over here, that means you're beginning effectively another step. Or equivalently, or perhaps more accurately, what it means is at this point in time, you are at the level of movie elements. And so if you start typing additional constructs, they're going to start relative to where you are in the document. So if I go ahead and hit Enter now, what I get back is a node set of size 6. And if we do a quick check, enemy of the state is rated R. Looks like clerks is rated R. You know, this is taking too long. Let's just actually go C slash the title of these movies. Go ahead and execute this. Now I just get back the titles of these movies. In fact, let's confirm now. You know, I don't want just titles. You know, I actually want the ratings themselves. Just to do a sanity check. In fact, all six of these movies are rated R. And notice, to be clear, that even though we effectively took a step within the predicate, it was only for the purposes of the predicate. So we don't actually move deeper into the document when we're in the predicate. And that's why, outside of the predicate, I can simply type slash rating. And that's going to be resolved relative to where we were before the predicate was applied. So in short, we now have a query language for getting at certain aspects of the, an XML document. And there are other axes, and we'll look at these in a moment. But in a nutshell, this is the types, these are the types of queries that will allow us to get at XML data in, again, dare say, a much more user-friendly way than you've seen thus far with SAX and with DOM. Indeed, indeed. And this file doesn't particularly lend itself to doing multiple predicates because the movie element itself is terribly boring, or the movie's element. But we could do this. Suppose, just for the sake of demonstration, suppose that movies did have a, um, let's say, owner. Suppose this is a database of movies that someone owns rather than just being a movie of databases. And suppose the owner of these is Malin. So if I similarly execute the query from before, which is to select the titles of all movies rated R, well, what I get back is the same set of titles. Suppose now, though, I only want to get back the movies that belong to the owner named Malin. Well, I could do that as well. But suppose now, just to illustrate a point, suppose that I want not Malin's, but uh, Bob's. Well, this now is going to return a node set of side 0. So yes, in short, you can have multiple predicates at, along each step of the axis. And what that does is, is that point in the location path filters down your node set and only resolves future steps with regard to the nodes that remain after that predicate. And as you might imagine, what we could do too is use Booleans of sorts. So if I wanted movies rated not only R, but OR that are rated, let's say, PG, 13, should this work? Can you use regular expressions or any other kind of wild characters in the, uh, you know, the equals R? Can you use any kind of wild cards? Uh, short answer is somewhat. And it's XPath2 and XSLT2 that actually introduce support for actual regular expressions. So we'll, we'll touch upon that perhaps a little more later. So it doesn't seem to be liking this. Is there a way to do this? Well, there's actually. Oh, no. Double, all right. Hmm. No. Is there a way? Well, this too will reveal in just a bit. There is, in fact, a way that you can execute more interesting queries than just single predicates and so forth. So it's some of the syntax tonight that we'll tease apart. So with that said, let's formalize a couple more things and come back to that in a moment. So what axes do, in fact, exist? Well, we've looked at child. We've announced that there exists parent. There's a reflexive one called self, which is sometimes useful only so that you can be very specific as to what you're talking about. And then there's these others, which um, are of varying degrees of utility. It depends on the types of queries that you're using. But ancestor simply refers relative to a node to all of its ancestor nodes. And that's going to be visually all of the nodes higher than it in the tree. If you think of a DOM 
or of a, an ex, a tree like model of XML as being like a family tree. All of the ancestors are the guys above. If we think of descendant, it's going to include everyone below the node in the tree. Descendant or self, obviously, is not only referring to the descendants, but also the node itself. So you get back the descendants plus one node. Uh, namespace nodes is useful when you start intermingling namespaces in a document, and XSLT and uh, XPath2 offer some additional support for namespaces. For the most part, we'll, we'll turn a blind eye to those until they become um, necessary to deal with. Parent we addressed earlier, and preceding and following, and following sibling and preceding sibling are perhaps best explained by way of diagram. So suppose that this is a representation of your XML document. Think of it as a DOM. Um, the blue node is current, our current node, so to speak. It's the node at which we are at by way of whatever location path we've executed already. Well, what does it mean to step from that node along the following sibling axis? That is to say, to step from where we are, which I'll refer to as dot, slash, and to then say following, sibling, and then colon, colon, because that's the axis. But in this case, we're not concerned about the names of the nodes we want. We want all of the siblings that follow this one in the document. So we're just going to say, you know what, go ahead and give me all nodes. So N-O-D, open, N-O-D-E, parenthesis, close parenthesis. Just give me all nodes along this axis. And just a sneak preview, this is almost always equivalent to just writing star there's a subtle distinction. So with that said, just intuitively, what are the siblings that follow this blue node in the document? The guys immediately to the right. And in fact, what you get with XPath and XSLT is what's called a document ordering, which is to say that you will get back nodes in your queries in a predetermined order. So according to the following sibling axis, you will get back, yes, those two nodes at far right that are in the same level of the tree, but quite specifically, you will get them back in order of one and two. And so as you see on your printout, they are numbered as such. And we'll see in a moment that nodes in a node set do come with an ordering. So they really are like an array or a vector where you can get at them effectively by way of their indices, or you can at least check what their index is. And so in this way, can you sort of trust what the next sibling is going to be because they're not just returned in some random order. If we instead look at the axis called descendant, well, intuitively, how many descendants does this blue node have? Well, it looks like six. So it's two children and two grandchildren, if you will. So what's the ordering that's going to be imposed on these? In other words, when you get back a node set by selecting not following sibling colon colon, but descendant colon colon, well, you're going to get back those six nodes, but in what's called document order. And you're going to get back node one, and then two, and then three, four, five, and six. It's effectively a depth first search is the order in which they are returned. Yeah? What's the distinction between following and following sibling? Is it one versus all of them? That's uh, a good, excellent question. So what's the difference between following and following sibling? So following sibling is perhaps the simpler of the two because it really says what it means. It's all of the siblings of that element that follow. What does it mean to just follow the element? The nodes that follow an element are all of the ones that, whose start tags begin after that element start. To, uh, uh, it is, with respect to the blue node, the elements that follow it are all of those whose start tags begin after this guy's end tag closes. Uh, it would be not quite. Those are the guys that follow it. Because everyone below this guy, recall, is inside of, is a descendant of this blue node, which means this guy's close tag technically doesn't really happen until at this point in the document. Effect, yes, that's a good way of putting it. So following is effectively following sibling and all of their descendants. So it literally has to come after this guy in the document. And the start tag, end tag trick is sort of a, a one way of thinking about it. Good question. 
And take comfort in that the axes with which you should become most familiar and just by nature will become most familiar are frankly child, attribute, and the others are less frequently used. Um, ancestor, this is an easy one at this point, but in which order are they returned? Well, they're returned in reverse order. So the closest parent, the closest ancestor, then the grandparent, the great-grandparent, and so forth. And it's even easier to go straight up since you can only have one parent, so there's only one direction to go in. Um, this dot, dot, dot is meant to be a little at-home exercise if you'd like to ask yourself if you start at one node, what do the various axes give you? So with that said, let's just jump over to stylus for a moment. Uh, let's choose, for instance, a specific node in the document. Specifically, let's choose the first movie. So I'm going to say database slash movies slash movie. And then I'm going to take the movie whose ID specifically is ID 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, close bracket, and that gives me a movie. So what that gives me now in spirit is a blue node in the DOM that is this document. So let's ask ourselves a question, how do we get at the parent node? Silly as this might be, since we were just there in this query. Well, we can simply say parent, colon, colon. Well, what is the parent in this case? Sorry? So movies, hmm. Movie. Oops. What's going on? Where are we in the document at this point? Well, let's see. Let's make this a little wider. Oops. Okay. Let's make it that wide. I swear, the only thing that's changed, I'm looking like an idiot in this demonstration because they keep, the only thing they've changed is the GUI. All right. I don't know what this is now. All right. I'm going to have to have some words with my friends. All right, so let's figure out where the nodes went. Uh -huh. All right, that was useful. Let's go to view, XPath query editor. I'd prefer that it come over here. This is really embarrassing. All right. <laughs> That's the query. No, that's not what we want. Oh, Jesus. All right. No. <laughs> I think we'll start recommending XML Spy this year. <laughs> All right. Now it's just not responding. Yeah, I think so. Yeah, the view menu is not. All right. They no longer support a view menu, it seems. All right. That's back. All right. We expect a much higher level of quality from the students in this class. This is, <laughs> all right, let's try this again. All right, Stylus Studio. All right, it's opened our documents. Maybe we do need the, I need the tips. All right. Wow. I think it's just a bug, to be honest. <sighs> Okay, mouse doesn't work, but keyboard does. All right. There we go. Thank you. All right. So, I'll be editing this video a lot tonight. Movies. Let's go back to our movie such that its ID was specifically the first one, which was ID equals uh, ID one two three four five six seven bracket, and we're back. Uh, one. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Okay, so we're back at the point in the story where we have just that one node returned. Sorry? So it's not going to be ID verbatim. It's going to be at, since technically we're along the attribute axis, which would be the longhand way of writing that. So in fact, this will return the same node as well. But up until now, we've been writing just the at sign. So if I go ahead now and say parent colon colon star, well, what do we get back? Well, we do indeed get back movies. Well, what does star denote? Well, star is what's called the node test that just selects a node of any name. And I did say a moment ago there's a distinction between saying star and, for instance, node. But in this case, they seem to do the same thing. And this is one of those precise definitions that's found in the recommendation. But long story short, all axes have a principal node type. 
star returns all elements of any name of the principal node type. Almost always is the principal node type an element, which is to say when you say star, you're going to get back all of the elements named whatever along that axis. The only time the principal node type is different is on the namespace axis, which we'll ignore for now, and the attribute axis. When you're on the attribute axis and you say star, you wouldn't make sense to get back element nodes because there can't be elements on an attribute axis. So star in that context means attribute nodes. So in short, whenever you type star, it's going to return intuitively the types of nodes, presumably, that you expect to get back. If for some reason, though, you want to get back all such nodes, not only an element's attributes, but also maybe its namespace nodes or some other types of nodes, you would in instead use the node node test, which returns all types of nodes, not just those of the principal node type. So this was simply to say that along a, query, along a location path, can we not only get to a specific part in our document, we can start moving around. And I caution that this is sort of silly, because we've already been there. And so this would be, uh, you know, dare say, a, a, an inefficient query, since you're doing unnecessary work by diving into the document and then diving back up. But it is sometimes useful to be able to navigate your way around a document so that you can get at data particularly within predicates, as you'll see. Yeah? Does it carry all the start of the root node, or do you think about having you know, separate queries that cascade on themselves? An excellent question. Does the query always start at the root of the document? The, the queries should always begin at the current context node. And the context node is determined by what queries you've already executed and whether you've finished executing those queries. And we'll see this more clearly in the context of XSLT. I will say that one of the shorthand notations that you're about to see anyway is the so-called descendant or self access axis, which actually we did see a preview of on the slide. We just didn't see the shorthand notation. The lazy man's approach to selecting all titles in this file would be to say slash slash title. Unfortunately, it's the lazy man's approach for a reason, because there's an inherent inefficiency here. Because you're effectively in this kind of location path, providing no hints to the, the XPath processor as to where to look in the document, intuitively, what's the implication then? So perfect. So one, you can get back in conceptually different types of titles. For instance, suppose these actors had titles themselves, Mr. and Ms. and Sir. Well, if they had title elements associated with them, we'd get those back. So that's one problem. And two, if you're not providing what are effectively hints in the location path as to where to look in the document, what might that mean for performance? Literally, it has to scour the whole document, which for small documents, probably not a big deal. And it might take you less time to write the query than it would for the processor to even go figure it out anyway. And so it's not perhaps a high price to pay. But just realize, typically, you would want to specify for performance reason the entire path. But we'll see that contexts come into play once we start doing, uh, doing this with XSLT. So with that said, With that said, what are some of the node tests that you can execute? Well, we've seen two of them, to say node, to say star, and we've actually seen a couple of others as well. All this while, when we've been saying, for instance, child colon colon something, like child colon colon movies, movies, quote unquote, is technically, technically known, what's, uh, known as what's a node test which effectively mean that is tested against the nodes in question, and it just so happens to be the name of the node that you're testing. So what these denote here is that if you specify some axis, child colon colon, or none at all, which is equivalent to specifying child, and you just say foo, what that's going to select for you is all elements named foo along that axis. If you specify foo colon bar, what this is going to do, and more to come on this, is to select all nodes called bar in the namespace associated with the foo prefix. But again, more on that in the future. Foo colon star means select all nodes in the foo namespace. Uh, star selects all nodes of any name, or elements typically, though sometimes attributes, depending on your axis. Node selects all types of nodes. And again, just to reiterate, the types of nodes we're talking about here are PIs and comments and elements and attributes, namespace nodes, pretty much all of the things we've seen in DOM already. If you want to select just comments, you can specify, give me along this axis only the comments back. You can specify text, 
which means get me all of the text nodes in the current access and processing instruction, which for some reason is ridiculously long. But that is the way that you would get out of processing instruction. So abbreviated syntax. These should become your friends since it gets very tedious very quickly typing a lot of these axes out. Child colon colon is equivalent to saying nothing at all, quote unquote. That is, don't type anything. Attribute, the at sign you've seen. Descendant or self, again, caveat emptor when using descendant or self. It's the lazier approach, but sometimes useful for development purposes is slash slash. Self node, as you might gather, is just dot, so you can refer to yourself either for reasons of uh, being explicit or for some other technical reason. And parent can be abbreviated as dot dot, which takes you from where you are up one level in the tree. So useful tricks and fortunately fairly intuitive, all of them. Well, what are the data types to be aware of in XPath? Uh, the, technically, these data types exist. Booleans, numbers, strings, node sets, external objects. Effectively, XPath is not a strongly typed query language, nor is XSLT a strongly typed language, which means for the most part, you as the developer don't really have to think too often about the types of nodes in question, particularly because there's a lot of automatic conversion that goes on, much like languages like Perl or PHP, which can be said to have types, or you can impose a sort of typing system, but for the most part, they don't have strong typing systems like, say, Java does, where an int is an int, and it's not just going to become a string, for instance. Uh, Booleans, though, it's worthy to keep in mind the types of functions that you have access to, or the types of, um, uh, types of uh, syntax that you can use with these various data types. Um, if you want to compare some value against the notion of true, you can simply call the true function. So that's like saying in another language like Java, Java, the keyword true. In XPath, you would simply say true, open paren, close paren. You can compare values using all of the obvious ones. You can and things together, or things together, negate things with the not function. And again, we'll see a lot of these in context. This is just meant to give you a brief reference and just a visual introduction to some of these relevant uh, capabilities. When you have a number and not a Boolean, you can apply all of the things that you might suspect, but beware that things like slash tend to have special meaning and it's annoying. But if you want to do division in the context of an XPath query, you're not going to be doing slash. You're going to be, literally be typing div. If you want to do modulus, you're not going to be typing per, um, percent sign. You're going to be typing mod. And believe it or not, in some context in XSLT, you're not going to be doing is x less than y. You're going to be saying is x ampersand lt semicolon y. Sort of a nightmare, but well, it's a shame if nothing else. Floor and ceiling and dot, 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 there are a bunch of other mathematic, uh, mathematics related functions at your disposal. String, you can escape, you can specify precise strings just as we did with the rating by saying quote unquote R for movies rated R using either double quotes or single quotes so long as you keep in mind the context in which you're in and you don't confuse the parser. Um, string related functions include such things as these, whose formal signatures I'll refer you to an online reference, perhaps the best one of which I'll show you in just a bit, but um, a lot of the ones that you would hope would be in a language as well as some others. Uh, node sets, that is when you get back from an XPath query, an actual node set, what kinds of things can you perform on it? Well, you can get a count of the number of nodes returned, just as Stylus was implying by telling us how many nodes were returned. You, too, will have access to that kind of value, just how big is the node set. Uh, you can get the position while all during, for instance, an iteration. We'll see in a, uh, after break the ability to iterate with XSLT over a node set and figure out what your current index location is to figure out what the last location is in a node set um, to take the sum of uh, the nodes in a node set and some related functions as well. And finally, per a uh, comment I made earlier, there's a lot of just implicit conversion that goes on, which is useful if you're not terribly concerned with types. But what it effectively allows you to do is approach XPath and in turn XSLT fairly intuitively, where if you've got zero in some context, you can simply treat it as being false, one is true, and so forth. And all of that just gets taken care of for you. So what we'll do after break today is use this query language, XPath, not just in a little quick and dirty demo in Stylus, but to actually start writing a little software, if you will, in XSLT that uses XPath simply as a mechanism for getting at the interesting data, and we'll use XSLT itself to actually do the transformations and the logic of the data inputs that we'll play with. So let's go ahead and take a five minute break. All right, 
So, XSLT, been around since the beginning as well, and in its most recent form since last month, as of January 23rd, 2007. Again, next week we'll spend a couple of moments looking at some of the differences in XSLT 2.0. For the most part, I think, particularly if you go off on work or your own projects after this course to make use of XSLT, you'll find that what support exists out there is predominantly for XSLT 1.0, and it's probably safer as such to begin your exposure to this language, not by assuming that there are features that you might not have in your own environment. So with that said, we'll defer some of the differences till next week. For now, let's get some of the basic ideas across, and similarly play around with examples to communicate those ideas. This, let's say, is our first, going to be our first XSLT generated style sheet. Uh, or web page rather. XSLT, Extensible Style Sheet uh, Language for Transformations, is a, a language for transforming XML from something into something else. Typically, another XML document, or equivalently an XHTML document, or near equivalently an HTML document, or even just a plain text document. In short, it allows you to massage XML input into pretty much any output format that you might want but it tends to be used within the context of XML output. Most of the stuff that's going on up here, and notice the introduction of XSL colon to a lot of these tags, is a lot of details that will become interesting later on, but for now just give us a level playing field, and so they help get us to the type of output we want. But in short, let's go ahead and do the following. What I'm going to do is open a file quite similar to this one, specifically that from project two, so that we focus on that as well simultaneously. And this is that file called myblockbuster.xsl, not myblockbuster.xml, which is what we were looking at. This is again a Stylus Studio, and what Stylus is is not just a WYSIWYG for playing around with XPath queries, but it's an environment for, among other things, developing XSLT style sheets. And it's a wonderful tool, uh, despite its U, uh, GUI changes recently, for developing style sheets for a number of reasons. One, just the WYSIWYG type, or just the, uh, the IDE-like support that it gives you when prompting you for the appropriate types of data or XSLT elements, as we'll see. But what it also does is allow you to execute your XSLT within the confines of the same window, to preview it within a smaller window in the same. Uh, XML Spy does the exact same kinds of things. And the alternative, as we'll see, would be to run something like Zalen, which is Apache's implementation of XSLT 1.0, which effectively is a command line program. And we will use that a lot, both on NICE as well as in projects three and four to automate the production of output from XSLT. But while developing it, typing commands at a command prompt, much like you've been typing ant, for instance, or Java C for project one, simply ends up distracting you from the process of developing. So these tools are useful for keeping you within one environment. With that said, for the most part, this looks like what on the screen? It looks like just like HTML or XHTML. We've added a few wrapper elements, as they're called, XSLT elements to this file that are going to control the output somewhat, but pretty much everything from here to here is just XHTML. So what I've gone ahead and done in Stylus is I've gone to the file menu to open, and I open the file called uh, myblockbuster.xsl, and this is literally the view it gives me. What you need to do, though, when using XSLT is associate the XSLT style sheet with an XML document. They're not meant really to be executed in a vacuum. Right? The whole purpose of developing a style sheet like this is to transform XML input. The means by which in Stylus you associate then your style sheet with an XML document is by clicking the button up top that's labeled dot, dot, dot. And XML Spy has a button similarly toward the top of the menu that allows you to associate the XSL file with an XML file. In Stylus, it simply asks us for the source XML URL, and if you opt to play around with Stylus, you can ignore most of these options, to be honest, and you can just navigate to the XML file in question on your hard drive. And a useful thing to configure as well in Stylus, as well as in XML Spy, is a base URL, which simply says if you have any relative paths in your XHTML output for like image source, or for ahrefs and so forth. This allows you to specify the base against which to, uh, to uh, resolve any such relative URLs. And that's important, certainly for our project purposes, because as you may have seen in the code, we tend to give you relative links and so forth so that you can move things more easily from your machine to NICE without everything breaking. And so this allows us to keep everything relative. So I've simply specified that all such URLs should be resolved relative to the same XML directory. And that's going to make sense when you see in a moment 
the source attribute of this image tag is dot dot gif, which is one level up in the project uh, to directory slash my blockbuster, and then down one level in the GIF directory. So that's why that's there. And just FYI, at least in Stylus, the way that Stylus implements that base URL trick that makes such relative URLs work is to use the base tag, which is not valid in XHTML. So because we tend to output XHTML, Stylus doesn't play nicely with this. And so you'll find that you'll want to comment out such things as the doc type declaration for XSLT, uh, at least in Stylus, possibly in XS XML Spy as well. Otherwise, the base URL trick will not work. And what you'll get is broken icons instead of actual images in their place. Well, quite simply, what I'm going to do is execute this style sheet. Bear in mind that I've just associated it with my blockbuster.xml, which is that file we've been looking at all this time, again, which looked like that. And notice that there's really nothing interesting going on in this style sheet. Yeah, there's some stuff up there that we might not be familiar with yet, but for the most part, there's no logic here. All this is is HTML markup or XHTML markup. So what's going to happen now when I click the execute button up here is Stylus is going to give me a preview of the result down here. And this is just an embedded Internet Explorer window because what this style sheet has generated upon being processed is quite simply XHTML output. Right, completely uninteresting because we haven't even done anything with the database. All I've outputted is this GIF, which obviously was hard coded in the XSLT file. But what you get at the left hand side here, and XML Spy offers the same, is you can view the source. And what's been outputted here is precisely that raw XHTML that we had in the original file up above. So what's happening here exactly? Well, pretty much. Any tag, any element to be proper, that's in the XSL file that's prefixed with XSL colon is being treated as an XSLT command, an XSLT element. And that is being processed by the XSLT processor, which in this case is Stylus, but on nice will be Zalin. Each of those XSL colon commands are processed according to their definition in the specification. Anything that's not prefixed, though, with XSL colon is just outputted raw. And so what we have then is the ultimate output of just the HTML file here. Because if we tease apart now some of the setup here, well, this is just our optional XML declaration, which doesn't really need to be there. Uh, this is the root element for any XSLT style sheet, quite simply, XSL colon style sheet. That means here comes a style sheet. Well, these things here you'll become uh, more familiar with over time just by um, exposure to them. But for the most part, they specify what version of XSL we're using. Uh, it specifies this namespace trick here. And we'll come back to that again in the future. But for now, that's a useful trick. Um, and if you recall a email to the listserv from a more industrious student who was jumping ahead on project one about Zalin prefixes of some sort, this was actually the fix I proposed. And you may run into that yourself. And for now, I'll suggest that you just delete that at some point, And you may, in fact, experience yourself what it means to exclude that line. But for now, the only interesting part of this file appears to be what is sandwiching the HTML or XHTML in the file. So XSL template is sort of one of the most fundamental building blocks of any style sheet. An XSLT style sheet is, built, is typically built up of one or more templates, named templates or unnamed templates, as we'll see they're called. And you might guess what this one is doing just by inference, but this is a template that matches, what does it seem? The root. So what this effectively means is that because we've paired in advance this style sheet with an XML document, what an XSLT processor effectively does is it looks through the style sheet for all of the templates you've defined, and it tries to match, so to speak, all of the matching templates to the corresponding data in the XML file. Because every XML document has a root, this simplest of XSLT style sheets literally matches the whole document and only matches once, because we only have one template and there's only one root to the document. So effectively, that's allowing us to apply this style sheet to the XML document. And that's all. Now, all it's outputting for now, recall, is HTML or XHTML, and it just appears to be outputting this logo. So that begs the question, who cares? Like, what can we actually do with this? Well, we've already seen XPath, which allows us to get at 
data in an XML document. Well, let's start to do something with it. And let's use this project two code as um, a means of bootstrapping ourselves to some additional syntax and features of this language known as XSLT. Suppose quite simply, my first goal with XSLT is just to output by applying XSLT to XML, a web page that gives me a list of all of the movies in my database. Well, specifically, I want the titles. And we've seen how to do that in XPath. So how do we do this in XSLT? Well, what I'm going to do down here is I'm going to affect a loop using XSL for each. And here, too, is where a tool like XML Spire Stylers are wonderful because they teach you by putting in front of you exactly what you can type. The for each construct takes one of uh, zero or more attributes, namely select or XML space. For the most part, we'll ignore this. Select is the one of particular interest. Select is a common attribute to a lot of these XSLT elements, and it literally means what it's called. It selects a certain node set. And what goes in between the quotes for this select attribute is guess what? An XPath query, exactly. That's where these two are going to intermingle. So I want to select all of, I want to ultimately print all of the titles of movies. What XPath query would you propose I begin with? Okay, so slash database. I should probably turn off this technology for lecture. Slash what? Okay, so slash title. All right, close quote. Close bracket, and another nice trick that you get in a lot of editors, just closes things for you, saves you time. All right, so now the question is, how do we get it out there, the title? Well, we're going to introduce XSL, value of, and notice it has both disable output escaping. This has to do with if your data has like amp uh, ampersands or angled brackets, do you want to output those raw, or do you want to have them converted to ampersand LT semicolon, that sort of thing. So be aware of those kinds of details. But we're going to just select the value of, but what? Well, first of all, this is a loop. And on each iteration, we're going to have some context node of what type is that node on each iteration based on our XPath query. It's a title node. So we want to output that title. Well, title is what kind of node technically? So it's an element. So we technically want to output not the element per se, but what? The content of it, really, it's text child. So how can we go about doing this? Well, a wonderfully useful trick is to just select the value of that element itself. Because it turns out in, this, in the recommendation, the value of an element is the concatenation of all of its textual descendants in document order. So that's sort of another depth first search and just take all those tech notes, text nodes and concatenate them together. Now, title recall from our demo file, and again, you have a printout for reference, is a leaf element effectively. Right? It's as deep into the document as you get because the only thing beneath it is a text node, the actual title. So if I simply print out the value of the title well, that's going to print out the concatenation of all of its descendants. It's only got one descendant, a text node containing quote unquote startup.com, for instance. So it suffices to print out this node. Well, how do I get at myself? All right. So I literally just put dot, which recall was shorthand for this reflexive one, myself, but that quickly becomes annoying to type. So we do dot. I'm going to execute the style sheet, and voila, we have a very ugly project too blossoming here. All right, so we need a quick fix here, right? Let's at least clean this up because there's no white space being output or no useful white space. What do I want to add here? So I could add text, but again, recall that if you just want to output something raw, just don't prefix it typically with XSL colon. So that is to say, what are we looking for? We're looking for a BR, effectively. So why not just do, after the title, let's just do a BR. I'm going to re-execute. And now what we get is that. Well, what is happening? Well, again, you can view source down here. Same view. I'm just viewing the source. Let's scroll over. It's not pretty printing it here, but that's fine, since it's just a preview. And notice now that after every title element, it's outputting a BR. And that's why it's starting to look a little better. If we go back to preview mode, this again is what it looks like. Yeah? Why is it not helping the like, XHTML version of BR, just in the BR? 
It's a good question. And this is one of these um, WYSIWYG editor quirks. Because I commented out the XSLT part, it's defaulting to HTML by default, which is it takes it upon itself to remove things like that trailing slash. So if I were to get rid of, I'll show this just so you know what to expect. If I put the doc type declaration back in, which generally is the proper thing since we're, our goal is to output XHTML, just so that we're being a little more proper and um, careful with our output. If I re-execute the style sheet now, notice that the image breaks. But if I look at the source, there is now a doc type declaration and it's XML. We're even outputting the XML declaration. The reason it's broken now is because that base tag is no longer being outputted because it's inconsistent with the XHTML transitional spec. And so Stylus takes it upon itself, not even to show it, even though I'm sure I suspect Internet Explorer would understand it. So it's a trade-off. And this is, again, this is a development environment, though. This is not obviously the software we're really developing for someone. So it's simply a trade-off. And perhaps, I didn't test it this morning, but XML Spy might handle that a little more elegantly. But for now, the quick fix is just to turn that off. OK, so what else can we do? And again, let's use this as stepping stones to more interesting things. Well, this is sort of an ugly list. We've promised the ability to apply logic to these things. Well, how do you go about sorting? turns out that some elements, including XSL for reach, can take as their first child, if they're at all, such things as XSL sort. And sort can take on any number of attributes, the most important one of which is select. So you specify what field to be sorting on. I'm going to be sorting on myself. That is the title. Again, to be clear, if you use sort, it's got to be the first child. You can't just put it in eventually. Re-execute, and notice the list at the bottom is now sorted. Well, suppose that I wasn't doing BRs, but instead was doing just commas. So comma like that, re-execute. I similarly get a sorted list, but there's a little bug. Silly bug, but we can use it to illustrate some additional logic that we have in XSLT, which is namely the trailing comma, which if nothing else is just sloppy programming. And there's an easy fix for this, even though we have to pay the price of a conditional check quite often. Well, the simplest fix would just be to ask yourself on each iteration, if we're at the last element, don't output the comma. If we've got more titles to come, output a comma. Well, we saw a glimpse on one of those slides of some of the position-oriented functions. And it turns out that you can say XSL if, if takes an important attribute, which is test, which is just what test you want to perform. It's in here where you can do equality checks, mathematics, a lot of those expat things we saw glimpses of earlier. And what do I want to test? Well, I want to test if the position of this node does not equal the position of the last node. And if that is the case, what I want to do is output a comma. Otherwise, I don't. So with that said, let's re-execute. And now we do have the fixed list. And if I actually inserted a bit of white space, we'd get spaces in between them as well. Yeah, well, we'd have to, uh, yeah, good. And a couple of those are not working for reasons we'll defer for now. OK, yeah. Uh, how to do the association? Sure. In Stylus, an XML spy is identical in spirit. Stylus is this rather well hidden dot 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 button, which just brings up this prompt, which is unnecessarily complicated for our purposes. All you want to specify is the source XML URL, which typically is just going to be on your local file system. So just. Mm hmm. Correct. You can put the association in the XML file. You can use a processing instruction for certain applications and say, for this XML file, use this XSLT file. More common, though, is not to specify it in the XML input, but to specify it in your software or in your code. What we'll do, for instance, with project three and four is we'll use Zalin, which is Apache's XSLT processor, which isn't a, uh, you know, a GUI like this. It's instead command line software. It's a library, effectively. But it's the same idea, where essentially, when you call the method, called transform, you specify not only the name of the XML file, but also the name of the XSL file. So in terms of processing, um, when a request comes to, let's say, a web server, mm -hmm. um, is, how is the process, how is the request being processed in terms of, okay, so, 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 so,
So, and just to repeat for the camera, so who's doing this association when, for instance, a request comes in to a web server for some content? Well, usually XML and XSLT, if used in the back end of a website, are used as sort of subroutines of whatever logic you're using for the whole site. And literally, we'll do this in projects three and four. So when a request comes in for, say, foo.jsp, we'll be using JSPs and Java servlets eventually in the course. In that JSP at some point would be some explicit mention or reference by a constant or whatever to the XML file itself or the string of XML and to the specific XSLT file that you're going to use. And it's entirely within your own code. So they typically, the association between XSL and XSL, XSL and XML is external to those files themselves. It's done by the higher level software that's using the XSLT processor as a subroutine. In this case, Stylus is using its own XSLT processor as a subroutine. Zalin is a processor, and your own code will be using Zalin as a subroutine. And one of the nice things, in fact, about Stylus and XML Spy is that even though I believe both of them come with their own XSLT processors these days, via the various uh, options menus and such, you can actually specify, you know, don't use Stylus, use this version of Zalin, for instance. So you typically get, as I alluded to in a previous week, you know, weird things like Stylus at one point supported ampersand NBSP semicolon, even though it shouldn't have, because that is not one of the predefined five entities in XML, but it was useful. Unfortunately, if you get used to developing in this environment, port your code over to another processor like Zalin, all of a sudden your code breaks. So a useful trick even with using these GUI editors is to specify, don't use your own processor, use mine, and namely use the zalin.jar file that you, you know, downloaded from Apache's website, for instance. But I'll defer to the menu options for doing that. For the most part, you don't have to worry about that. Um, it's not, uh, it's not, tends not to be a huge problem. Okay, so with that said, Let's turn our attention back here for a moment, just tease apart some of the formalities and then come back to a couple of other uh, representative examples. So what types of nodes exist in XSLT's view of the world? Pretty much the same types of nodes that we've already seen. And I put these up as a list just to, to, to reiterate that each of these languages, each of these APIs has its sort of own view of the world that tend to be almost identical to other languages, other recommendations view of the world. And that's a useful thing, but just realize that all of these APIs and languages are in spirit meant to stand alone. But because particularly we're seeing them all back to back, there's a lot of relationships among them. Elements. What kinds of XSLT elements, that is commands, can you use in a document. Well, some of the most common ones are that we'll be seeing a lot over the next few weeks are the first and foremost that appears at the top of the document, apply templates, which we'll see in a moment, and call template. XSL template we already saw, but we'll explain exactly what that means in just a bit. For each is useful, value of we saw as well, and there's a whole bunch of others as well. Uh, when it comes to these things called templates, you can match on different types of nodes, performing the effectively node tests, which we talked about earlier. Node tests often are just matching on the names of a node, but you can match on the type of a node as well and say, use this template for all comment nodes, for instance. Well, what do they typically look like? Well, we've seen this one, which is sort of a neat trick for just saying match the root of the document and let me take over from there. Let me grab what data I want. And that's precisely what we did in our example just now. You can also, though, explicitly mention what types of elements you want to match on. And I will say that the, tr the intended spirit of XSLT is to use more constructs like this, where you define individual templates for individual elements. But I would say that pedagogically, to be honest, I think it's a little harder initially to begin wrapping your mind around XSLT and its syntax, taking this approach of using templates that match on specific node types and do, and do what's really called a push approach, where you push the XML through your style sheet, as opposed to this, which we just saw a glimpse of in our example, which I would call more of a pull approach, where you say, match the whole document and then let me via for each and value of pull the data that I want. And I think in a couple of weeks' time, the distinction will make more sense, but I'll show you both tonight. But you'll see in a lot of our initial examples, we take this approach, where we just match the top of the document, and then we start to pull out the data we want. Because I think intuitively, it's a little simpler as you're acclimating to the syntax. So with that said, how can we translate, or how can we see this other sort of 
perhaps more proper view of the world. Well, right now, this again is what I would describe perhaps as a pull approach. And by that I mean, again, we match the root and we literally start pulling with very explicit XPath queries the data we want. If we wanted to sort of flip things on its head and just define in advance definitions for how we want titles and such, treat, titles and such treated, we can actually define individual templates that match certain types of nodes. And what I could do is the following. Notice that in here I have this code again that iterates over all of my title nodes. What I'm instead going to do is go down here and implement XSL template match on title. And then down here I'm simply going to say, and just to make it clear that we're doing something different, I'm going to make it bold this time. So XSL value of select myself and then close bold. And I'm not even going to bother with the commas for now. I'm just going to keep it simple and do BRs. Okay? With that said, what I'm going to do up here now is get rid of the for each construct, which tends to be used more in this pull approach, and I'm going to do the following. XSL apply. Actually, let's do this with a, a smaller step first. So XSL for each. Let's introduce that again. For each. Select. I'm going to say database slash movies slash movie, and I'm going to stop at movie now. So what I have now is a node set containing all movie objects in the document. What I'm now going to say is, you know what, now that you've got all these movies in hand, go ahead and apply all of the templates that relate to the title elements. In other words, take our context which is this node set containing all these movie elements, step along the child axis, which is implied by not mentioning an axis whatsoever, and just go apply whatever templates relate to those nodes that I've just selected. Right? It's sort of just passing the bucks. You go deal with it. Let the XSLT processor figure out what templates apply to the nodes I've just selected. And if I go ahead and execute this style sheet, notice at the bottom, I got rid of the sorting for now, but the bold-faced list of titles is now appearing. Well, how did that happen? Well, the sequence of steps effectively is now almost the same in that we match the root of the document, I output some static content, then I select the nodes that I want, and then I say, eh, go, select, go apply whatever templates are related. Alternatively, I could go one step back and say, you know what, why am I even iterating if I can just leave it to the XSLT processor to figure this out? Why not just select for my application of templates, all of the title elements in the document. And that too works, and that would be the more proper approach, because again, for each is more of a construct of the, the pull view of the world. And this is really pushing now the XML content through your style sheets, to continue the metaphor. Why is the template that we're in right now, why is that automatically applied? Or did we set it above that applied template? Good question. It doesn't matter. So the question is, why is the top one matching first? Um, we'll come to that, we'll formalize that in just a moment. It has nothing to do with the order in which they appear in the file, fortunately. It matters because the matching by definition starts at the root of the document. So whichever nodes can be matched first, get matched first. The root is obviously higher in the document conceptually than a title element, which is a descendant, and so he matches by default. What happens if we don't have that? So what happens if we don't have this at all? Well, what I could do is get rid of this guy altogether, and we'll just have this template. I'm going to go ahead and run the style sheet. OK, so the XML page can't be displayed. Let's see what that means. Well, now this is sort of strange. It looks like we've got a dump of all of the text content of the file. Well, why is that? Well, out of curiosity, let's do this. It looks like some actor elements are being outputted. And you know what? Uh, I don't want to see any of those actor elements. So let's go ahead and just to see what happens, let's say XSL template match on, let's say, actor. And you know what? Don't do anything. All right, do nothing whatsoever. It's an, em oops, it's an empty element. Let's rerun this, scroll back up, and now notice there's still some white space there, which you might be able to explain away already in your head, but the actors are gone. You know what, let's go one step further. We know that actor elements are children of actors, and I don't want the actors anyway. Let's just nip it in the bud one step higher in the tree and say template match actors, and then do nothing with them. Hit execute, 
And now we've gotten rid of that white space, which should make sense because recall that in addition to in the actor ele actor's element having actor children, it also had some text nodes, which was all that pretty printing. And that's why we were getting it earlier. So intuitively, what seems to be happening here? Well, it looks like, as I said earlier, the, the first nodes that can be matched with existing templates gets, gets, get matched. Well, we have a template for title, but what comes higher in the document than titles? Well, the movie elements, the movie element, the movies element, the actors element, the actor element, and so forth. There's a number of nodes higher in the hierarchy that is this tree, and so what appears to be their default behavior? Just spit it out. So it looks like there's some built-in templates whose default rule is to just dump the textual children of this node raw to the file. And so when I had the bigger template that we began with, match the root, I was preempting all of that sort of automatic processing because I was matching the document and I was only calling apply templates to the title elements, thereby overriding any of the default behavior for the other guys. I preempted them by matching the highest node possible, the root. But if I get rid of that match and I just let the XSLT processor do its thing, what happens now is that it applies whatever built-in templates exist for each of the nodes that are higher than the ones for which we do have explicit template definitions. I'm overriding then, in effect, the default behavior of the title element and saying, just, don't just dump its text content, dump it with bold tags, effectively. So where is this coming from? Well, if we look, actually, to the formal definition, what you have free with any XSLT style sheet you get without even writing it yourself are these three templates. Built in, it's like a, an implicit constructor in Java. If you don't implement it, it is there. There is some means of instantiating your objects of your classes. What you get for free in XSLT are these three templates. And the only way you can turn these built in templates off is by overriding them. And that's what we've been doing. We overrode the biggest one of them all, which is the guy that matches the root. So let's tease these apart. This is perhaps the most important template in XSLT because it really is what begins the whole recursive process of parsing the whole XML file. This matches what? So star typically refers to elements. So match any element or the root. So this is sort of a catch-all, almost a catch-all. Catches all elements and it catches the root. Because it catches the root, this is clearly by nature going to be the template that matches by default. Because no one else matches the root, it appears, only this guy. Well, what is the definition for this template? Well, this template simply says, for whatever node you match, apply templates. Well, it turns out that the select attribute we saw has a default value. Take a guess what it is. It's star, or more specifically, child colon colon star. So they're equivalent. So what this effectively means is that when you match on the root, eh, just go apply whatever templates apply to his children. But wait a minute. If his children are of type element, which of these templates then applies? That is, which template matches elements? Well, it's the same one, right, because of the star that you just noted. So we have this recursion. Assuming the root of your document has child nodes, or descendant elements, rather, well, which template matches those descendants? Same one, but what does that template say? It means go recursively match all of your children. So built into these three lines, do we really have the ability to recurse over the entire document's set of elements, no matter where they are? So wait a minute, but if all you're ever doing is recursing, where the heck is the outputting of all of that ugly data? Well, that data is coming not from element nodes, but from what type of nodes? those text nodes. So that begs the question, what is the built-in template for text nodes? Well, it's this. And these three lines, quite simply, though perhaps a little confusingly, explain why text nodes values just get dumped raw to the screen, as do attributes values. Yes, if effectively you override them. If you match a node yourself, your template will have a higher priority, as they say, than the built-in template. So yours will apply, and these will take a backseat and never get executed, most likely. 
So what happens here, if you can sort of take a leap here, and honestly, you'll appreciate this once you start playing yourself, start deleting parts of your own code, and I think you'll get a sense of why your code's behaving in a certain way. But in short, these three lines simply allow us to recurse over the entire document structure, namely all of the elements, all of the elements in the document. As soon as we hit a text child, and again, this selects all children, and some children might be text nodes, not element nodes. As soon as we hit a text node, this guy applies, and what's his behavior? To print his value, which means that's why we were getting Kaleo Aizaza Tuzman as the first actor in the movie file, and we were getting The Fugitive as one of the movie titles, because those were text nodes of respective elements. Well, what happens to all comments and PIs, apparently? They're just thrown away altogether because of this empty template definition. So literally, and it's sort of a beautiful thing, there are pros and cons to XSLT, but there is some beauty to its definition in that its entire power comes from these three built-in templates. Everything you do derives from this definition. It's sort of an, a, an, a powerful thing. Jumping back, just so you see, sure. Sure, so actually let's do that before we dive into name templates. Okay, do you want to frame the question specifically? Um, well, when you have the uh, push, when you just have the template for the title, mm -hmm. the titles were not in alphabetical order, mm -hmm. but the template has to go four in each, so if you have a template that you want to be in alphabetical order. True, what you're going to get it is in document order instead, if you're simply applying templates in that way. So if you have an alphabetized, then you have to do these four and these four each. The simplest way is to do that, I would say. For now, I would say yes, that would be the way to do it. You can, yes. Um, there are, with XSLT, there are often many ways to do different things. And let me take the fifth for now on the scarier type of syntax, just for now. Other questions on the example? Well, let's just ask one question just to reinforce what we've just done here. So, this is why we have all actors being outputted. The easiest way to preempt. And um, you, could, you could effectively sort the node set that you're then applying the templates to. Um, but again, for now, let me wave my hand and say the easiest way is to do it with the 4-H. But we can come back to that. Other questions? Okay, so just one quick question for me then. If you didn't want to have, so the downside to taking this approach of defining individual templates is that it can become tedious in that if you don't want a lot of the data to be outputted, like I don't want any of the titles, I don't want any of the ratings, very quickly do you start having a dozen or more templates that do nothing. Well, you could certainly use little Boolean expressions with the vertical or operator that we saw, and that saves you some steps, but even that seems an inelegant solution. So realize one of the takeaways from what I did a moment ago by stepping conceptually higher up into the tree and saying, you know what, just stop at the point of reaching the actor's elements is sort of uh, intuitively a more effective way of short-circuiting some of the built-in behavior. That is, don't define this template as I initially did for actor elements, nip it in the bud one level higher. Or you can go to the full uh, the, to the full extreme and simply nip it in the bud at the root element and then as we did in our first approach to this problem, pull the nodes we want from the document, and then apply whatever templates we were interested in. So it really depends on the trade-off. For your uh, first stab, certainly at my blockbuster in the project, I would propose taking the first approach using the given myblockbuster.xsl file, which matches on the root, and then just get comfortable with the syntax and pulling the data that you want. And the my blockbuster part of the project is relatively easy. It's really meant as a simple uh, environment in which to begin exploring XSLT and XPath, and it's with the X2 part of the project, which we'll conclude tonight's discussion with, that you really take your newfound skills out for a spin, and it assumes that you've got comfortable with XSLT via my blockbuster. So for tonight's purposes, suffice it to say that not only can you have unnamed templates that match types of nodes based on node tests, you can also have named templates, which you can explicitly call, very much in the spirit of like a functional programming, uh, in a uh, imperative programming language, where you call a method or you call a function explicitly. You do that via syntax like this, 
And nicely enough, when you have named templates, you can also pass to them parameters. This allows you to explicitly call little helper routines, if you will, helper templates, passing in parameters. It allows you to uh, reuse code in a manner that's probably quite familiar to you. It literally is as simple as this, and where the dot, dot, dots are, can go any code you want, an XSL value of, some raw XHTML, or any of the other um, elements that we'll become familiar with soon. Realize, incidentally, tricks like this, you can begin perhaps to infer how these things work, but this is saying, uh, for one, XSL template name foo. So this is defining a template called foo. This, because it appears first, and this is another one of those elements, if it's there, it's got to be at the top, XSL parameter called bar, its default value is going to be Baz. So notice that I had to put single quotes around Baz, otherwise Baz would be interpreted as a node test on the, which axis? Child axis. Okay. Down here is how you would call a function, how you would invoke a template. You would call template named foo, and I'm going to pass with it, pass to it this parameter called bar, selecting not bar as just the arbitrary value thereof. If I didn't pass this parameter at all, it would take on that default value, as that suggests. Okay, so you we'll see this. You would use dollar sign, dollar sign. Uh, parameter name. And actually, let me jump back for just one moment. We will come to this and spend more time on this next week. But a useful thing to know now, especially for my Blockbuster, is the following. If I'm going to jump us back to the file's original format. Let's go back to XSL, template, match on the root element. And I'm just going to arbitrarily, or I'm going to very quickly output a very simple, improperly, invalid XHTML document. And I'm simply going to, let's see, XSL for each, uh, select, uh, I'm going to be very lazy here, for, only for the purposes of demonstration. I'm going to select all of the movie elements this time. And now, if I want to output those titles again, I can say XSL value of, and recall this is slightly different. Last time in the for each, recall, we selected what types of nodes? We selected the titles, and that was fine, but this time I'm just going to choose the movie elements, but rather for the values, what do I want to select? I effectively want to select child called title, or I can just say title. So this is just to illustrate again this notion of the the context, the, the context nodes in play. This means on the iteration you're being handed a movie. So if you want to step in deeper relative to the node currently in your iteration, you would say something like title there or child colon colon title. So I can go ahead and do that and output its value. If instead, let's go ahead and output some BRs to make it a little prettier. If instead I actually wanted to have some raw HTML, um, I might want to do something like this, a href. Um, you know what, let's go to like send the user to yahoo.com and I don't quite remember their syntax offhand, but it's something like p equals whatever the query is that you want to pass to Yahoo. Well, you know what, I want to pass in, um, I want to pass in, let's say, the title. We'll go to Yahoo and what you'll see now is, let's see if this is going to work in our preview mode. Yeah. So what I did there was I used what's called an attribute value template, which is a crazy long name for quite simply saying put output data within squiggly braces that is in your current context. So it looks like I didn't quite get the syntax right, but I got the URL right, and that was sort of the takeaway. What I've been able to do now is there are other ways to do this, and argue, are honestly much more verbose ways of doing this, but what I've simply done is because I use these squiggly braces here, what that means is to consider whatever node is your current context, which again was a movie, and output the following step. And it's a nice sort of, not even quick and dirty, it's a nice elegant way of getting at whatever data is currently in context. The more verbose way, just so that you get a sense of what you can do, though not necessarily would want to do, is you can use commands like XSL elements, a name, A. Then here I could go XSL attribute. The name of this thing is going to be href. And then 
here I'm going to say XSL value of is going to be select HTTP colon slash slash and let me just say dot 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 for now. That is the much more verbose con um, syntax for actually constructing an identical output but explicitly saying to XSL's processor, give me an anchor tag here, give it an href attribute, assign that attribute the value of so forth, but it just very quickly becomes tedious and you start to end up spending more time on development rather than less. And so it's things like the attribute value template that we just saw that are meant to be time savers. But bear in mind the formal where, um, where the formalities um, can be imposed or at least how the proper way might be to do it. Um, with that said, just to wrap up some of the basics this week, and again, this week is meant to be sort of a teaser, but enough of a teaser that you have a, a uh, foundation on which to start experimenting with XSLT on your own for the first two parts of the project. Um, we've seen how to select the values of the nodes, and recall that, again, the value of a node is defined as the concatenation of all of its textual descendants. Um, what XSLT is doing here, just to slap a label on it, is what's known as recursive descent processing. And we've sort of been describing this all night long without giving it a name, but it effectively means starting at the root of your document and just recursively applying whatever, in this case, templates actually apply. And if you want it, you can look at an online resource or the recommendation itself for the real technicalities of what it means to apply a style sheet to an XML document. But in spirit, even the X, er, technically, even the XSLT document is modeled as a tree itself. And nodes, technically speaking, in the XSL are in fact applied to the nodes in the XML document. But for the most part, that's an implementation detail for those interested in implementing the parser and processor rather than using the language, as is the case for us. Um, what processors exist? Zalin is perhaps the de facto standard. It's free. It's well performing these days. Um, it is constantly being updated. For a while, the Apache had been saying that they have no plans to support uh, XSLT2 and XPath2, and that was as recent as this past fall that they made such claims. Now that it's officially in recommendation status, I suspect they would come around, but frankly, there's no telling. And it's it's whether or not groups like that ultimately support it that are perhaps going to determine its success more than just the, the features that actually exist in the language. A reference implementation does exist for XSLT2 by Michael Kay. This is the fellow whose name I mentioned, I believe, in lecture one. He's the author of really the only book that I think of all the others is worth owning because it puts so much information in one place. This is the book that's about yay thick, if you've seen it. You can take a look at it in this building in Grossman Library upstairs if you want to take a peek. If you go on Amazon, if you get the edition, first edition, 1.0 of XSL, you can probably get it for under $20 these days. And of all the books, that's a useful one to have. I would not go pay coup prices, frankly, for these kinds of books. You can get them much cheaper online. But I would say, only because of the sort of unclear status or fate of XSLT2, which, who knows, could work out to be the standard that everyone adopts in just several months' time. It's probably best to just begin with XSLT1 so you don't start coding in two, with 2.0 features that simply don't work, not only on NICE, but also in your own, perhaps, future environments. Microsoft has its own implementation of an XML parser and XSLT processor that pretty much comes with IE, comes with .NET and so forth, called MSXML. Um, this is how, for instance, even IE can render style sheets itself. Uh, Stylus Studio comes with its own. XML Spy comes with its own. There are others out there. I would say the most commonly cited ones would be Zalin, Saxon, Microsoft, just because it's on people's machines every, anyway, and these two environments. These are sort of the biggies, but there are certainly others out there. There exist such processors for PHP and Perl, and that's another nice feature about XSLT is that it has been now around for a while, certainly in its version 1.0 form, and you can really grab off-the-shelf implementations to use in your own projects, not just in, say, a Java environment. Um, We'll wave our hands at this since we covered this earlier, just what CSS is sort of meant for and what you can do with XSLT. What we'll see next week is some of the um, Java code that you can write using uh, XSLT and XPath. Just a sneak preview of the types of packages and classes we'll be using. For the most part, these will not be of concern to us for project two. And that's where we'll conclude tonight is talking briefly about what project Two is all about. Project two has three parts in increasing 
uh, or an increasing order of, I think, fun and complexity. The first is relatively simple. It asks you to use a very, to implement a relatively simple XSLT style sheet that takes an XSLT parameter. Turns out you can actually pass parameters, not just the templates, but the style sheets themselves. And the project shows you the syntax for doing that. This simply asks you to convert one time format, given in an ISO time format, like a long string, to use some of those string manipulation functions like substring and so forth, just to get comfortable with some of these queries and output an XML version of it in accordance with the spec. So it's meant to be just a, a simple introduction. My Blockbuster becomes more fun. You literally use the files we began with tonight, myblockbuster.xml, .xsl, .gif, and there's a couple of other files that you can play with as well. And it essentially tasks you with coming up with a you know a pretty enough web page that presents all of the information in that file but with relative hyperlinks using fragment IDs so that you can click the name of an actor and see what movie he's in for instance or click the name of a movie and see what actors are in it and in fact just to give you a taste of the kinds of thoughts you should be having with regard to implementing such realize that I might want to do the following if I'm gonna I'm gonna go back up to my simple implementation of movies and I'm going to output XSL value of select and then I'm going to select the title of the movie I'm going to put this in I'm going to put this in bold tags to make clear that it's the title but what I'm next going to do is the following I'm going to put a BR tag so again you should know what to expect, we get this bold faced list down there. But I also want to print out some of those actors and recall that the actors are associated with movies by way of the fo following. Each movie might have zero or more actor ref elements whose values just happen to be the same as the IDs of those actors. So just to give you a sense, and again a lot of this certainly after you've seen examples should hopefully begin to come intuitively. If you think you can do it, try the syntax and it probably does work for these relatively simple goals. Suppose I want to append to the ends of these titles the list of actors that are in the movie. Well what I really want to do then is do XSL for each and I want to select all of the actor references associated with this movie but now I could just be boring and select value of select dot. Unfortunately this is going to look pretty stupid because to the user it's going to be completely useless information and in fact let me add a BR there again we're not focusing on works of art here tonight okay pretty useless so effectively we want to be able to do a lookup in another part of the document using this value well how might we do that well effectively we have access to the actor ref now because we're iterating over those so really now I want to start back at the document root and if I use an absolute path I can get up there I don't have to just use dot 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 to get back up in the document I want to get into the actors and then I specifically want the actor whose ID equals what So we've said dot before, so let me try dot, hit execute, hmm, problem. Dot, because it means self colon colon node, refers to the current context node, which in this case is actually the actor's value, which is not what we want. So there needs to be a way in a loop to get at not the immediately current node, but the context node in which we began. And to get at that, you use current. And just know that, whoops, current now gives us a web page that looks like this. Unfortunately, you can't go current, current, current to back out as, ma of as many for eaches as you want. It only works one level up, but it's a wonderfully useful trick. And we'll see in the future, too, that there's actually functions like XSL key, which allow you to define in advance effectively, effectively hash tables to make these lookups even more efficient. So in the final minute here, the teaser for project two is really as follows. You have, and unfortunately you'll need a microscope or glasses to read this thing, so there's a very large PDF on the website that you can hit control F on and find values in it. Xtube is the end game of project two, where you're handed a several uh, dozen or hundred kilobyte file called xtube.xml that per last week has a whole bunch of geographic, um, aesthetic, and metadata related to London's tubes, trains, and trams, 
And at the end of the day, what you will have is a web page that within the confines of one page, you have relative hyperlinks and so forth that effectively convey to the user how they can get from one station to the other, where they can transfer, where the lines lead, and so forth. And then finally, after two weeks' time, you'll have in your toolkit knowledge of SVG, which will be your tool for implementing a graphical depiction of that same data. So starting tonight and until next week, you should feel ready to dive into the first two parts, which is it's B2B time and my blockbuster. And feel free to make use of the listserv for any questions that come up. Otherwise, we'll introduce more XSLT and XPath next week.